21. Matthew 21. Uh, I'm not in a Wednesday night series right now. And oftentimes when I'm preaching uh, through a book, as we are going through the Gospel of Matthew right now, a lot of times one of the things that's very tough for me is not being able to preach all the messages, to preach all the things that maybe uh, don't fit with the theme that we're preaching through it in. And so it's a great opportunity sometimes just to get to preach some topical themes or just to preach some, uh, some truths things that we would like to highlight but we just don't have time for. And that would be where we're at this evening. So as we are beginning, or actually in the beginning part of Matthew, uh, as I'm looking over the book and I'm just thinking of all the things I'd like to preach, but I know for sake of time we'd be in the book for 20 years. If I preached everything I like, or I'd like to, then I'd like to take the opportunity to preach some, uh, some extra things. And so we have a chance for that this evening, and it's fitting of course, for the time and the season of the year. <clears throat> and I, uh, I'm anti-Grinch. Well, actually, I really like the Grinch uh, quite a bit. But uh, I'm anti-people that are anti-Christmas. Uh, I just, uh, I, we're, being, we're, we're having something taken from us as believers. And fascinating, it's fascinating that it is oftentimes rogue believers that are the ones really on the attack of Christmas right now. Matter of fact, this year and last year, probably more than I've heard in my entire lifetime, I have heard Christians who celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ just radically condemned. And it's out on the internet, and of course things spread like wildfire there. And a lot of people talk about how, you know, Christmas, the celebration of Christmas, you know, has pagan roots and all these things. We actually dealt with that, didn't we, last uh, Sunday, this past Sunday evening. And we looked at the scripture and we saw a principle where the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the Scripture says that twice, actually, in the passage where we were at, emphasizing the reality that <laughs> the devil's always tried to steal things, always tried to take things from us as believers. And it's just, I, logically speaking, it, all of the arguments aside where people say, well, this has pagan origins and, and roots and this is what this means, and they start adding all these things. Um, we actually talked about Christmas trees, actually, Sunday night. Is it wrong to have a Christmas tree? It's a pretty good question. And uh, a couple of the, of the points that we made, or a couple of things that we actually discussed was, you know, what does a Christmas tree mean to you, and have you ever met anyone who's ever worshipped a Christmas tree or understands Christmas tree worship. I could give you the details for a good Christmas tree worship service or whatever. And so, you know, people will say, you know, this is what the roots are, this is what you're doing when you do this. Well, no, actually, I'm not. Isn't it funny or isn't it just, doesn't, shouldn't it occur to us or we shouldn't we think a little bit about the reality that in the springtime we bring flowers indoors? In the summertime, we bring in harvest. Like, well, I'm from mid, the Midwest, Kansas. In Kansas, one of the first things they do is when the grain turns gold, you know, they bring in the harvest. They, they braid the wheat and bring it in, you know, because it's beautiful and decorative and timely. And in the wintertime, when the only thing that's alive is an evergreen tree, you decorate with evergreens, you know. And, uh, it's, people have always decorated, always brought outdoor beauty into the in, indoors and that sort of thing. Uh, are there people that take wood and carve images out of it? Yes. You ever done that? You ever worshipped a carved image? I listen. I don't care what people do that's wrong. It's not what I'm doing. And I'm a Grinch as far as Christmas trees go. I think they cost too much for not lasting long enough. You know, my wife will tell you. You know, I'm not. A, I'm not a Christmas tree person. I think the reason we didn't have a Christmas tree in our house when I was growing up is because my dad was too cheap to buy one. And uh, the reason our Christmas tree in our house is you know, one of those little countertop bathroom ones in our house right now is because I'm too cheap to buy one. Actually, my wife could have a Christmas tree if she wants a Christmas tree. But uh, we just don't have space for a nice one most of the time. But it bo does bother me, you know, they, what they charge for a tree that, you know, they pay you pay 50, 60, 75, whatever they are now. I'm making up numbers because I haven't paid for one in a long time. And then you throw it away after Christmas. Just it's hard for me. It's the Grinch in me, but I'm not against Christmas trees because, you see, I think it's just fine if you're not worshiping a tree to celebrate the season uh, with the tree. 
You say, Pastor, what about people that worship the, 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 the time of the year and the Yule Tide and all these things? Um, did you know that the times and the seasons of the year were created by God on the fourth day? There are people who worship the moon, but it still belongs to God. There are people that worship the sun. God made the sun. You see, the progression, in other words, we're going to have taken away from us anything that anyone corrupts or perverts or anything that the devil misuses. We as believers are going to be missing a lot. And so that's one area where I just don't have any... I, well, it's not true. I, it's one area where I struggle to be patient with the person who's watched the latest YouTube video telling you, that you shouldn't have, do this, and they're really not logically thought through or or uh, well planned present. They, they may be well planned presentations, but they're they're failing in in biblicity. They're not biblical, and so that's a problem. But there's another area, uh, I think, as believers, another thing that we ought to consider, and that is that the greatest thing that's ever happened in the world is the birth of Jesus Christ, and that's one of the grandest understatements I've ever made. The greatest thing that's ever happened in this world is that Jesus came. You say, well, Pastor, but the greatest thing was when Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Jesus came to die and be buried and to be raised from the dead. But literally, from the moment man first sinned, mankind needed a Savior. And those individuals who cared about spiritual things and had a desire to, uh, to have their relationship with God reconciled, Jesus was the desire of the nations for. And so literally, when Jesus Christ came, as the, it was the most anticipated event that ever happened in the world. When Eve's first son, Cain, was born, you remember what she said? She said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Literally, she hoped he would be the Messiah. When Cain killed Abel and Seth was born, remember what Eve said? She said, I've got a man from the Lord. This is going to be the one. And truly, Seth was the one who uh, was the descendant of the godly seed that would have been in the line of Jesus. And you go through Genesis and you trace all of the individuals and there's a distinct, uh, there, are, there are two distinct lines in Genesis. Those who look for the Messiah, who look forward to the reconciling of the nations, and those who do not. That's always been true, hasn't it? In every generation, there are those who seek Him and those who do not seek Him. And for those of us who know Jesus, my friend, the fact that, that He came is the most precious truth in the world. And I just cannot imagine the notion that a God who would tell the nation of Israel to make memorials and to have Passover and to do things in memory of great things that God has done, I can't imagine God's people thinking that the greatest thing God ever did was that He sent His Son isn't worth celebrating. So, uh, I want to look this evening a little bit at Jesus, and I want to look at uh, the promise of, of the Messiah and uh, the fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled that same promise. A few weeks ago, actually, uh, we looked at, in, in the beginning of Matthew on a Sunday morning, we looked at the genealogies and, and some of the prophecies having to do with that. But if you're in Matthew chapter 21 this evening, I'd just like to look at some things that were prophesied about Jesus, that Jesus fulfilled, that make it a dead certainty that you and I could know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And I'll be quite frank with you, it isn't so much that you and I need that, because once you've believed in Jesus, you have the witness of the Holy Spirit. And so you know the Word of God is true. So the message this evening isn't trying to convince believers that Jesus actually is the Messiah. But it's good for our hearts sometimes just to see how specifically God spake and how much people knew that what God said was the truth. We know that when the wise men came from the east and said, where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star and we've come to worship him. We know they knew the prophecy in Daniel 9. And individuals who should probably not have been considered ones who would have believed in Jesus actually did. And the Bible says that when they heard it, when Herod heard that they'd come, that he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And so those who should have rejoiced at the coming of the Messiah actually did not. And we saw the difference, didn't we? 
between individuals. That is, some people, uh, the difference between someone who receives Jesus and someone who rejects Jesus is just a simply, simply a matter of what you do with the truth. It isn't the truth that's different. It's what you do with the truth. And so your believers here this evening, I think, I think this group would be a crowd of, of individuals that believe that Jesus is the Christ. But I just want to look at some amazing truth that I believe will not only strengthen in your faith, but give you some things that you could share with people that maybe would wonder whether or not Jesus could have been the Messiah. And so here we are in Matthew chapter 21. Let's look at verse beginning of verse 4. Um, well, no, we need to look at verses uh, 1 through through 10. When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, it's just the story, and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, they sent, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell you the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, and a colt the full of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Isn't that, a, isn't that just a neat account? Can you imagine somebody walking up to your house, taking your donkey and, and the, the baby donkey, and you say, Why are you, what are you doing? And they say, uh, The master hath need of them. Okay. <laughs> I mean, only God can move circumstances like this. It reminds me of when uh, Peter was asked, uh, does your master pay taxes? And he said, yeah. And when he went to Jesus, he said, I told him we pay taxes. I'm summarizing. And uh, Jesus asked the question of whether or not the king of the universe should have to pay taxes. And the answer was obviously no. But Jesus said, lest we offend them, you know, take a hook and go catch a fish and take the coin in the mouth of the fish and pay your taxes and mine. You know, this... I've had some great days fishing, but uh, <laughs> none quite so much like that. The best I come up with is, you know, my bait in the belly of the fish when I'm filleting it, you know, but no coins so far. I'm waiting for the day, you know, that I catch a fish and it's got a gold coin and it's enough to pay my taxes. But uh, all that being said, these things are not coincidental. They're miraculous that Jesus did. And the miracles Jesus did did prove that He was the Christ. So verse... Seven. The Bible says, and brought the ass and the colt, put them, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, "Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest!" And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, "Who is this?" And the multitude said, "This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee." Would you mind going back just a few pages in your Bible, not very far, but to the second to last prophet in the Old Testament. So right before Matthew and Malachi, uh, to Zechariah in chapter 9. Will you please go back to Zechariah chapter 9. And um, I'll just read. Uh, it, I'll read it because if you don't make it on time, you'll just have to take my word for it. You can write down the reference if you like. If you have a Bible that you write in, maybe you could cross-reference those two verses. Here's what Zechariah prophesied. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did, isn't it? And so when Jesus told the disciples this to, to, to go and loose this donkey and bring it, of course He was aware that the things that He did must fulfill the prophets, the prophecies. But I'll just tell you this. I'm not sure that a person who is a student of the things that the Messiah must do could be well enough informed to have fulfilled the prophecy to the degree that Jesus fulfilled them. In other words, uh, we're not going to look at these passages this evening, but in Matthew chapter 2, uh, there's a reference to Hosea 11. When the Bible says that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, have I called my son. You know, if you read Hosea 11 and you didn't know 
that Jesus was the Messiah, you'd never know Hosea 11 was prophecy. Even though it ought to occur to us that a prophet prophesies or foretells future events, not historical events. In fact, the matter is reading Hosea 11, I'd say, well, this is talking about you know, Israel coming out of Egypt. That's what the historical context of it is. It's what it looks like, and that's what it actually was historically. But no, my friend, God does things to a greater degree. God's plan is more than our plan. God's understanding is more than ours. No individual who was trying to imitate a Messiah could have fulfilled the prophecies Jesus did. And I'll tell you the hardest or most difficult way uh, that a person would have to just try to imitate the Messiah, a couple of things that would be very difficult. One, the time of your birth. You know, being able to time, you know, the time that you're going to come into the world. Because the wise men knew when Jesus was going to be born, according to Daniel 9, didn't they? They literally knew the year that Jesus was going to be born because of the calendar and because of the prophecy that God gave. Is that 70 weeks minus 7 plus 1 uh, or till the Messiah's death. And so they knew, they knew when Jesus was going to be born. That's why they came to Jerusalem. Uh, it's pretty tough for a baby to swing that one. Now, parents may be good, but it's even tough for parents, to be quite frank. And then getting the star, uh, and, uh, you know, getting down the location for birth. Jesus was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem, but he was supposed to be called out of Egypt, and he was a prophet from Nazareth. Three things that he needed to be. It's tough for a baby to swing that. Okay, Mom and Dad, you know I'm born, now let's get to Egypt. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, anyone who's raised children probably knows the futility of raising your kids for your calling or your purpose. Anybody who's raised children kind of knows, don't you? You can call your kids to do something, but you know, if you want to raise your child to die for the sins of the world, you're going to get a have a tough time getting your kids to cooperate. <laughs> Ever think about that? Uh, okay, so we're not speaking of those, but we do see the first prophecy that I wanted to look at. And, and again, this evening, if you want to understand the organization of what we're doing, it's very topical. But if you want to understand the organization, I'm primarily looking at passages in Matthew because as we're studying through Matthew, I won't have the time to look at the fulfillment of the prophecies. And so I wanted to, to cover that. And so... Uh, I will tell you that there are other ones, like for instance in John 13, you know, we, we, we see that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm 41, 9, David's prophecy that Jesus would be betrayed by his friend, or that it would be his friend that would betray him, but that doesn't fit in our context. Uh, go to chapter 26 of Matthew, will you please? Matthew 26, and let's look at uh, beginning down, I think it's in verse 14. Okay, I hear the silence of pages not being turned. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he thought, sought opportunity to betray him. Now, this isn't the message this evening, but have you ever just thought about this interaction between Judas and the chief priests. And you ever wondered, you know, how they could be so ignorant of the Scripture? I mean, if you, if you are uh, the chief priest, you really ought to know the prophecies, shouldn't you? And this whole matter of 30 pieces of silver being prophesied in the Scripture, you know, why couldn't they negotiate 29? Or 31? Or 40? Uh, you know... <laughs> Uh, it's amazing to me how complicit the unbelievers who wanted to have a part in stopping the ministry of the Lord Jesus, but actually were a part in fulfilling the prophecy and helping the ministry of the Lord Jesus. So it's amazing how complicit they were and should have known better. Isn't that something? Let, let, look at uh, uh, back in Zechariah. Are you? Are you? Uh, have you? Were you there? Are you still in that area? Uh, we'll be in Zechariah again. So 
uh, I, I should have warned you earlier. Zechariah chapter 11 and down in verse um, 10. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the pieces. In verse 11, it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Verse 12, And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast into the potter, goodly price that it was that I was priced out of them. And I took the pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And so this is the reference, this is the prophecy of the of the Messiah and uh, the prophecy of the 30 pieces of silver that would be used to purchase the, pro the potter's field. Uh, that field which is Asel Dama, that is the field of blood. The potter's field. Remember when Judas went out and hanged himself and they threw, he'd thrown the money down at the priest's feet afterward, you know, and he had had the innocent blood on his hands. And so after he killed himself, they took the money and they bought a potter's field where people would be buried. Um, <laughs> wow, isn't that amazing? It's not amazing that a man who was used to betray people and men who were trying to stop the Messiah from fulfilling his purpose became such a complicit part of the prophecy of the Messiah. Isn't it amazing that Jesus could fulfill prophecy in his death? It's an amazing truth. Uh, in verse... <clears throat> This is in, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 27. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's look at 27 and look at just the part of the potter's field because I, we already read the rest of that portion So in, in Zechariah, but let's, let's look at it in Matthew 27. I got ahead of myself. First, verses 3 through 10. Uh, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver and said, It's not lawful for them for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> the hypocrisy of it. I mean, you are people that are willing to pay for murder that have a problem with taking murder money. I, I just the, the irony, the hypocrisy of it is, is beyond me. So in verse 7, they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which is spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Now people that challenge or question the inspiration of the Scripture would say, uh, it was Zechariah that prophesied that, not Jeremiah. Did that occur to you when you were reading it? It occurred to me. It's one of those things that causes me to question sometimes. I've seen as well uh, in Matthew before that which was spoken by the prophet. Uh, <laughs> there's a very, very logical, very simple answer that I hope will help you this evening. First of all, I know enough about the Word of God to know that there aren't errors in it. There aren't mistakes in it. And I also know that people like Jeremiah the prophet prophesied things that weren't written down as part of the Scripture. And this is one of those instances. Uh, for in, Let me give you another for instance. You know that there were four letters to the church at Corinth. Not two. You know, we read First and Second Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians actually isn't 1 Corinthians as far as the letters that Paul wrote. But the difference between 1 Corinthians and the other letters that the Apostle Paul wrote was simply that it was inspired. And it was for the church in a permanent way. It was intended, had doctrine in it that was the Apostles for today. In other words, 1 Corinthians is the Apostles for today. Everything Paul said wasn't inspired may have been true, the things that he said, but truth doesn't make it the Word of God, does it? And so this would be just in one of those other instances that I believe God on purpose puts in the Scriptures to cause us to think and to just be able to marvel at how amazing His Word actually is and how incredible it is, um, just the, the kind of a God that He is and the way that He communicates 
with us. Interestingly, last night on door-to-door -door soul winning, one of the discussions that, that it took a lot of our time was the Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture. And to someone who literally had read none of the Bible, uh, was questioning that the Bible was the Word of God. And this person kept saying, man wrote that book. Man wrote that book. And I said, I don't have a problem with you saying man wrote that book so long as you uh, will agree that God inspired the book. In other words, man's writing it is fine. Uh, it's just fine for me to say to you, write this, and you write what I say, and uh, whose word is it, yours or mine? Well, you may have written it, but actually, I'm the one who wrote it. It's my writing. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's one of these things that we as believers, we need to be thinking people. And I just want to tell you something. For 35 years of my life, I've been a student of the Scripture. Since a child, I've been a student of the Scripture. I should say I've been a saved student of the Scripture. I studied the Bible before I was saved. So my entire life, I've studied the Scripture. And I've never found a mistake in it. I've never found a contradiction in it. Ever so occasionally, I've seen things that you'd say, now wait a second. This says from the beginning of the reign. And this one says this one says 15 years, this one says 13 years. And so I've got to go back and I've got to, and like in Luke, for instance, look at Josephus and uh, look at when, you know, this individual is appointed to reign versus when he actually took the physical office. And you realize, okay, this is one perspective. This is another perspective. And both of those help me to have enough of a perspective that I actually can use it ultimately to date the actual beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist, for instance. Because of this distinction between the two, I'm able to see when the ministry of John the Baptist began. That's incredible, isn't it? And my friend, as deep as you want to get and as much as you want to, uh, as, as, as far down as you want to dig, the more technical truth you can find in the Scripture by asking questions. Don't be afraid as a believer to ask questions. Don't think, oh, if I ask that and it challenges my faith, I might find out the wrong answer and it will undermine me, and then what will I do? I'll tell you something, you'll never find that God's Word isn't true. You'll never find that it's got errors or mistakes. Don't be afraid. Uh, don't be afraid to be questioned. You know, I, I meet people and I think that the reason they get angry when they discuss something is because they're threatened. I'm never threatened when anybody attacks the Word of God because it's a book that holds up just fine. And so we as believers ought to be that transparent, that open. We ought to be that confident in our faith to know there are Bible answers for everything. I hope that's a help for you. That's not the message, but it's a tidbit from the message. We're almost out of time, so let's do just let's look at just a couple of more. There's the, the scripture prophesied that Jesus would die a sacrificial death for us. And uh, this is an important one because this is perhaps the one that was most overlooked and misunderstood, yet one of the most clearly prophesied truths about the Messiah. Isn't it true that the disciples, the Bible would say, for instance, in John, that this he spake signifying what death he would die, but then the Bible afterwards says they didn't understand that Jesus was going to die. They didn't believe that he was going to die. Remember when Peter rebuked Jesus for saying that he was going to go to the cross, that he was going to die, and Peter rebuked him for it? You know, it's incredible, actually, that people who looked for the coming of the Messiah, people who were analyzing Jesus were thinking that He had come to set up an earthly kingdom when actually He'd come to die for sin. Much of the prophecy of Scripture deals with Christ setting up an earthly kingdom, but those are separate events. An eternal Messiah, an eternal God, could not die and set up an earthly kingdom and have the kingdom be forever an everlasting kingdom. And so Jesus must first die for sin. And then He'll set up His earthly kingdom. That's a future event prophesied in the Scripture. So let's look at that. That'll be probably the last one for sake of time that we have uh, time for this evening. You're in Matthew chapter 27 or did you go to back to Zechariah? If you are in Matthew chapter 27, will you please look down at verse 50? This is after Jesus had cried again with a loud voice, yield up the ghost. Or, I'm sorry, and Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And I want to read verses 51 and 2 just because they should, they should cause you to have questions. Not the 
not in the text we're looking at for the point we're making, but it's auxiliary. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. You think that might have put people on notice? If you uh, look at the veil of the temple, it was required to be woven, it literally was six inches thick. It's a piece of cloth six inches thick. It wasn't like a little sheet, you know, shiek, you know, rip the sheet. We're talking about a veil that was supposed to bar access from the holy presence of God and the, the high priest. The high priest would go in beyond the veil once a year. But this is a place where God's holy presence was and there needed to be a strong separation between man and God. And the Hebrews uses the illustration that, that we go to God today through the veil of Jesus Christ's flesh. So it's an interesting study for you to study the veil of the temple. It's an interesting study as well because as Christians we use a lot of bad terminology when we talk about uh, our eternal home. And when we uh, talk about heaven and hell, we use a lot of bad terminology. A lot of Christians don't know the difference between paradise and heaven. And they don't know the difference between heaven, and that is the reference of where God is, and the heavenlies. And that's why we get some wacky pictures like, you know, we're going to be, uh, you know, just floating in the clouds. We're just going to be, heaven is up. Heaven is, you know, the heavens that are around us. And God is beyond the heavens. God is in a real physical place. He is in that heavenly Jerusalem or that heavenly city, if you will, a place where He's built mansions for us. It's a real, solid, physical place. It's in the heavens, but when we die, we're not going to go to space, outer space. You know, we're not going to become stars or planets or uh, little ugly babies with wings uh, playing um, harps. I never wanted to. You know, I, I always liked what, if you ever read uh, Mark Twain's Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Samuel, Samuel Clemens, what do you want to call him? Uh, and he talked about the description of heaven from the widow, Douglas, and then Miss Watson. And he talked about when uh, the widow Douglas had described heaven, he said, just make your mouth water. You'd want to go there. He said, when Miss Watson would tell you about heaven, you'd decide body would be better served going to hell <laughs> than going to heaven. You know, and so being accurate in our ver vernacular, you know, that, that, uh, the irony that Samuel Clemens used actually describes a lot of what, you know, I remember being a kid and just looking at Grandma's house at these pictures of babies playing harps on clouds, and I just thought, man, that would not be cool. I do not want to do that. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad heaven isn't that way. Uh, another thing, you know, that we oftentimes mess up a little bit is our terminology. A lot of Christians don't know the difference between hell and the lake of fire and heaven and paradise. And so that's a matter for study for you that's, again, ancillary. It's extra this evening. Now back to... Uh, where we looked at Matthew 27, 50. I want to look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. My Bible goes automatically to Daniel chapter 9. It's one of those places in the Old Testament. When I open it up, it's written all over, scribbled all over. And it's one of those places that is such a significant uh, portion of Bible doctrine that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's had a lot of use in my Bible. And I think it should for you as well because it's so important the specific prophecies about the Messiah. Listen, uh, without the Word of God, we cannot know who God is. And without the Word of God, the men who came from the East could not have known who the Messiah was. And so this is very, very significant prophecy. Will you please look at verse 27 when we see when Daniel thought that the 70-year captivity would actually culminate in the Jerusalem being rebuilt where God sends an angel Gabriel to... I say to look at something, then I keep talking. I'm sorry about that, but I need to lay the, the groundwork. And I know I'm, I'm doing a terrible job speaking sometimes, but this is, this is helpful, so bear with me. Uh, take the truth, not the messenger, or whatever, okay? Um, so, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel when Daniel knew what was prophesied in Jeremiah, that there would be 70 years of captivity. And then after the 70 years, Daniel's saying, okay, it's time to go home. And so he prayed and prayed to God, asked for an answer. Is it time? You know, this is what you promised in your word. And God sent the angel Gabriel to explain to him that from the going forth to restore, 
from the from the command to go back and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah was going to be 70 weeks. And the word week is a word like the words, some words that we have that means a measure of seven. Some of the words we have that mean a measure is like, for instance, a dozen. Uh, a dozen means how many? Half a dozen, six. A couple is two. A few is, I'm not sure about a few. I, I think it's like three or four, right? Several is like around five or something like that. That's a general number. But a week is a specific number that means seven, and it would have been understood by Daniel and by those individuals who penned uh, the scripture. It's understood in contemporary literature that a week means seven. It doesn't mean seven days, it means sevens. So seven days, seven, seven minutes, seven hours, seven months, seven years. And evidently in Daniel it's pretty well understood to be uh, a week is 70 years. So, I'm sorry, is, a week is, uh, yeah, is a year. And so when we see 70 times 7 minus 6 minus 1, we have the, you know, the, the uh, 69 weeks, we have the 62 weeks. I'm not going to go through all of Daniel. That's, I preach that plenty of times. We've looked at it several times. I could study with you on an individual basis. But I want to look at the prophecy about the Messiah because it's significant because most believers thought that Jesus wouldn't die. They thought that the Messiah would come and set up His earthly reign and that was the particular reason that misunderstanding was much of the motivation be behind the ruling class of His day wanting to kill Him. They were happy with the politics of the moment. They didn't want a Messiah to rule and reign because it would have supplanted them first and secondly, it would have shaken things up, and they just they liked the status quo. There are a lot of people that would rather things remain the way they are than to take a risk in order for things to be better. And they certainly fit within that mold. So in verse, now we're going to read uh, verse uh, 27. The Bible says, He shall confirm... Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, that's the wrong verse. It's verse 26. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Okay, do you see this? He shall be cut off, but not for himself. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Why did Jesus die? Because he was a sinner? Because he'd broken the law? Because he'd done something wrong? No, Jesus died because I'm a sinner, because I've broken the law, because I've done something wrong. The Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. And that was what he was prophesied to do. You could look at uh, 2 Corinthians. We won't this evening, but if you're taking notes, you could look at uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. You could look as well, let's, do, let's look at, as our last passage this evening at Isaiah uh, chapter 53, passage of Scripture about Jesus. Uh, let's look at verse 8 about the Messiah being cut off. Isaiah will be back just a little further from Daniel. Chapter 53. I want to read the whole thing, but I'm not going to. Verse 7, He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8, He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? Notice this. Uh, for he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Why did Jesus die? For the transgression of... His people. Verse 9 there. Okay, so we see that the Messiah would die a sacrificial death. I want to make one last point. If you were to read further in Matthew 27, you would see a uh, fulfillment of, of um, Isaiah 53, 9. And one of the fulfillments is the irony that Jesus, in verse 9, He made His grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Isn't it ironic that Jesus died with thieves on either side, and he was buried in a rich man's tomb? 
That's an irony, isn't it? Isn't that, that's just not the way it should have been, is it? I mean, he literally was with the poor, and he was with the criminal element when he died, and he was buried in a pretty nice section of real estate in Jerusalem. <laughs> you can go there today, the garden tomb. Pretty neat. Well, there are certain things that Jesus would say on the cross. We won't be able to look at them. He was, res he was prophesied to be risen from the dead. Matthew 28, 6, and Psalm 16, 8 through 11, Isaiah 53, 10, where we're at, please the Lord bruise him. But in verse, uh, the second part, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, is a prophecy of the resurrection as well. And so that's, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time this evening. I think I added too much that I didn't uh, intend to. But I hope it's been a help for you this evening just to look at your Savior, your Jesus, your Messiah, and to realize that no man could plan to fulfill prophecies that even the religious people were ignorant of. I mean, you can't find a prophecy of the Messiah anywhere in the Scripture that Jesus didn't fulfill. He fulfilled 100% of them. If you were to list, and there are lists, I recommend if you want to just do a study, Google's your friend. Uh, there are lists, pages long, of prophecies that Christ fulfilled. And when you begin to read each of them, you're like, check, check, yes, yes. But there are no lists of prophecies that Jesus didn't fulfill. And I hope that that is something that strengthens in your faith and encourages you to share what an amazing Savior that you have come to know personally when you were born again. I will remind you this evening of the significance of being born again. The easiest thing any person can do is receive Jesus. You don't need a great strength. You, only, you don't even need great faith. You know, I've heard many times, Brother Rick and I were actually discussing this this evening about how sometimes Christians complicate salvation. And, uh, you know, it's not even, it doesn't even take great faith. It just takes the kind of faith that makes you look and say, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. That's all it takes to be born again. You say, oh, you have to believe hard. You've got you to gotta really, really mean it. My friend, you don't ask Jesus to save you and not mean it. That's it's impossible. You say, well, maybe somebody would just try to believe in Jesus. Well, what if someone tried to believe in Jesus? What if they made the decision, I'm going to try to believe in Jesus. I'm going to try to pray to be saved. Don't you think it because they want to be saved? And my friend, that's all God requires to receive Him. Made the gospel so simple. Some things are tough in life. Some things are hard, but believing in Jesus isn't one of them. And it becomes easier when we look at who He is. My friend, Jesus was the Son of God, and Jesus did come not to set up an earthly kingdom at that time. He came to die for sin, for sinners. And all of a sudden, it becomes very significant and very important, doesn't it? Because Jesus came to die for my sin. He came to die for yours. And the Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. And so I guess our conclusion this evening is, have you received Him? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled every prophecy for the Messiah from the beginning of Genesis when man first fell. He was born of the seed of a woman as prophesied in Genesis 3.15. All the way through all the Scripture. And so have you believed in Him. Father, thank You. Thank You so much that God, we don't have a built religion that's dependent on man's cunning and wit and ability to deceive. But that rather instead we have a book that's actually your word and a Savior who is really your son. And God, that it's just an open book and that the truth in it is something that all we have to do is believe. Thank you. I pray that you'd strengthen us in our faith and help us to live for Jesus more in light of what we've learned this evening. And we ask this in his name. Amen. We're going to take some prayer requests uh, this evening. And uh, let me just start off by...